I mean, not bee supply, but bee, uh, yeah, the bee suppliers, the largest company in the world. They've got about seven stations, I mean, uh, in the United States. And back in 18 and 40, the Muths sold they dance, not 18 and 40, but 18 and 70s and 80s. They sold they dance <coughs> supplies in Cincinnati out of this store. Now, Dedant in 1849 was one of the largest processors of liquid honey in the world. They invented or developed a honey extractor, the centrifugal force honey extractor that slung the honey out of the comb so you could use the comb again. So I know that the patent hive that Langstroth developed in 1861, and I've gained the ranks of Langstroth and Kilburner uh, by getting a patent. I'm, I'm proud of that. Not only that it cost me some money, but <laughs> we had a lot of fun doing it and uh, it was developed over the years. But anyway, I'm sure that modern equipment was here in Northern Kentucky at that time. Muth having to do with that. Now, we need to glance backwards just a little bit and look at uh, beekeeping historically and biblically. Uh, historically, bees and the production of honey has been important since ancient times. Bees were kept in Egypt in the late third millennium. But the first identified bees beehive comes from a structure that was destroyed by the eruption of Thera in 16 and 28 BC. Uh, now, Aristotle was around, and I, I love to read uh, his animals' uh, books. Uh, Aristotle was around two, uh, 384 to 322 B.C. Now, he was a Greek writer, one of the earliest, and he discussed the production and the cultivation of honey. He wrote the best bees were the small, round ones. The worst ones were the drones. Now, there's three kinds of bees in the hive. You have the drone, which is the boy bee. And I told my wife I was going to tell the girls this. She calls me a drone a lot. And she told me not to come over here and act like a drone. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to tell you one thing, and I will tell the girls this. The drones are in the hive at the pleasure of the girls. They're there simply to rendezvous with the queen, <coughs> to mate with the queen. The girls tolerate them all summer long. They run them out in the wintertime. When my wife or in October. When my wife tells me I'm acting like a drone, then I know that it's time that I get some production done around the house or make myself not seen. So uh, uh, I won't say what else I, uh, that I was going to say to you because it wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, but anyway, Today we observe the drones as being present in a beehive merely to be available to make with the queen. When hard times come, the girls, they, they uh, decrease their numbers. And that's a kind way to say that they usher them out of the hive to fend for themselves. In October, you can see them standing on the, the front of the hive. The poor things. The poor things shivering and shaking. And then the girls go out there and they when the drones get so, see, they don't feed themselves. The girls feed them. And when they get so weak, the girls, two or three of them, just push them over and let them fall off onto the ground. And that's the end of them. Now, the um, Aristotle encourages the plant, uh, encourages you to, uh, us to plant about the hive. Pear trees, beans, medium, um, grass, yellow, uh, Plants, myrtle, poppies, creeping thyme, and almond trees. Because the flavor of honey, he says, mella depends partly on the flowers from which the nectar comes. Now, he says thyme honey is the very best. He says spring honey is lighter than fall honey uh, and is better in many ways than fall honey. Well, I got news for him. Uh, Hippocrates, from uh, 400 to about uh, 377 B.C., he uh, was the father of medicine. Now, he discovers uh, many uh, uses for honey, and they're practiced today. Now, the reason I mention this is because Boone County is very much a part of the world. 
It could not function without the world. And all of those pioneers coming to Boone County, all of those people coming in here early, they had the same, they had a chance to gain the same knowledge of these as I had. I've been intrigued with these little fellows since high school, since I was that big. I knew what they did because I had to tiptoe to get into the bee gums to get honey for my sisters who would wash for me, they'd cook for me, they would make me taffy uh, until I would go in and uh, mix in their... Have you ever cooked molasses and, and make uh, molasses taffy? Well, you just don't put sulfur in there. Or soda, I'm sorry, you don't put soda in there because it's, it goes all over. Okay, so they took care of me there if I would go and get them some honey. Now, he realized the healing powers of the honey. Now, he prescribed honey for many conditions, skin disorders, sores, ulcers, and you know, some people say that he might have been the first to prescribe honey for hemorrhoids. Now, he did mix a concoction up for some bowel problems, but some other folk, being smart, they want to interject that as being for hemorrhoids. But uh, the comment usually is that it's too good to put, you know, to throw away. But that's not thrown away. Now, honeybees and man have no doubt had a close association since the beginning of time. Anyway, since man has appeared on earth. Now, the Egyptians practiced migratory beekeeping because on the Nile River they would set uh, their skips, they would set their bee colonies on a barge and they would transfer that up and down the Nile River because if you will study geographically there's four seasons on the Nile and there's something blooming all the time. So as you go up, you come back, the bees are working. And uh, along the areas there, uh, barges could be tied off but the queens, the kings had to have one-sixth of the honey and beeswax that was um, uh, produced there. Now, about 1,000 years before Christ, or B.C., there were stated laws of the Manu that the king would claim one-sixth of the uh, honey. So, uh, Aristotle wrote that his hives, or the hives now, I firmly believe that he was a beekeeper, but because his observations were just too close and uh, to what is really inside the beehive, that he said his hives produced from, produced from 9 to 27 pounds, or he said that that was about what the bees would produce. Um, now, uh, I've, uh, there was a selfish reason for me to come here today. You know, back uh, in 18 and 17 and what, Boone County became a county? 1798. Well, you know where it came from, don't you? It came from part of Virginia and came from Campbell County. Well, I brought this man right here. He has a permit to carry. We're going to take Boone County back home with us. <laughs> we, we, really, we really need the tax revenue <laughs> in Campbell County. And uh, you guys are really <coughs> developing awfully fast. And we want rabbit hash. And any place would let, that would elect a dog as mayor has got to be a place to live. <laughs> and I'll take that back and put it in my backyard. I live near the golf course on 471 over there. Now, Boone County early on was known as Virginia. And uh, in the Filson Library, John Filson wrote that the discovery of the present uh, state of Kentucky hinted that many Indian tribes uh, frequented this area. The, the Shawnees, the, who captured Mary Engle, the uh, Cherokees, and the others. Now, as pioneers began to settle here, they did so in northern, in northern Boone County along the floodplains of, uh, of the county. And um, that was very similar to the Rhine Valley from Germany. Those, most of those folks were Germans. Now, I, I talked to a good friend of mine out near uh, the Creationist Museum where I frequent, Arnold and I frequent quite often, and uh, Ralph um, uh, Falsgraf. Well, he came into this area. Um, uh, his parents came over here about uh, 19, oh, 18 and 90, 18 and 89. He was born 1923. 
lost his wife recently, but he's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man. I have some pictures here that I want to share with you, and I'm going to leave one with the, uh, one person. Because Mr. Falscraft, his father, back in the 20s and 30s, I was uh, invited there a few years ago by his music-loving son who wanted me to restore uh, a building that his, his father and his uncle had to, that he put bees in. When they moved over here from Indiana, they discovered that ants and mice and wood roaches were just lovers of honey. And they felt it unsanitary to have those around the beehive. So what they did was they built a building. And they have that building. It's still standing there. They have that building on clay, clay tile. That clay tile eliminates mice getting in, ants getting up there, because you can put just a little bit of Vaseline or grease on there. No honey. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that eliminates them getting into there. And you go in there and you just work it inside. You harvest your honey inside. And uh, Ralph was telling me that his dad would go in there. And I, he gave me one of his dad's beehives. I loved it. I gave him a gallon of honey. And I'll give him another one if he wants it. But he's, uh, he's really a great guy. Now, this is, uh, this is when Ephraim Tanner arrived with 11 followers of mostly German ancestry. Uh, they, uh, they organized the Lutheran Church. We've already talked about that. But there was a man. Okay, the, the colonial legislature decreed the following order, May the 14th, 1645. It is conceived that John Eels should be placed in some convenient place where he may be employed in his trade of beehive making. And so forth. Ye town of Newberry to make up what he wanteth in defraying his cost. So evidently he had a hard time making a living, making beehive stuff because he was the only beekeeper in the establishment, in the settlement. Now, this is in keeping with bee stories and bee lore that has been handed down to me by my family. Was that the settlements, when these uh, pioneers came across the mountains, the most fortunate ones were the ones that had a beekeeper in the camp. And they would put that beekeeper out there, and the beekeeper would keep the bees in the background, way behind his camp. Now the story goes that if Indians attacked the camp, they would come up, and this old beekeeper, he would not shoot at the Indians, but he would shoot at his bees. And when the Indians got up close to those bees, what happened? They do much more than get up your nose, my friend. Don't they, Arnold? Yep. <laughs> it stung you, didn't it? Right up in there, because that finger wasn't long enough to get up there and get that bee out of there. And I told him, I said, Arnold, hold that. He said, it's up my nose. <laughs> so, but they'll get you. Now, I met a Mr. Banks. He goes around, he dances at the Appalachian Festival. He grew up about 40 miles from where I grew up in Breathitt County. He grew up in uh, out, uh, Wolf County. He's very much a part Indian. His son dances, and uh, they... Uh, uh, and he heard me talking once, and he said, I want to add something. He said, I'm not Cherokee. The Cherokees call the Indian, uh, the bees, the white man's flies. So, he said, that's in, that's in line with what I've heard, that the Cherokees referred to them as the white man's flies. Now, Undoubtedly, the first settlers were aware that arrived had an appreciation and a value for the honeybee and its products because where else would they get honey? Maple syrup only comes once a year. You gotta grow your sorghum to get your, your cane to get your sorghum. Now,
Now, Bill Eels, or Els, lives in Cynthiana, Kentucky. I've never thought to ask him. I've talked to him a couple of times. But I've never had time or thought to ask him if he knew Mr. John Eels from up in, that had the bees. He could be a descendant of that beekeeper there. Now, a, a very important question here is when those Germans came into the valley here, uh, the floodplains, did they bring those little black German bees with them? Does anybody know, have any knowledge of the black German bees? They were very small bees. Those were the ones mainly that I had when, that we had when I was growing up. They were good bees as long as they were happy. They were happy only when they could get things for the hive and the hive never got full. <laughs> if the hive got full, they always had a sign out, do not disturb or get close to me. And uh, they were quite vicious. Okay, bees were introduced by the colonists in 16 and 21 as reported by John Jocelyn, who resided in New England in 16 and 38. He reported that the honeybees have come from England and they're in good shape. So, and uh, possibly, um, possibly that could be uh, uh, when the, uh, when, when the Italian bees first came into uh, uh, the Americas. Now, Charles F. Muth and Sons of Cincinnati, Charles was born in Germany on uh, April the 23rd, 1831. Uh, now, when he came, when, he, when, when they came here, he developed the Muth Square Honey Jar. Now, these are very rare. But this is like about three other companies that have stolen or taken my parasite reducing board and they're making it. This has no name on it. So it's made, it's a renegade, but it's, it's very similar to the, even the size, it's a one pound jar and it's the size of the moose. So when you come up, please look, look at this because it could be it, it could be a replica of what he has. Now, <clears throat> when Charles F. Moot came to Cincinnati here, he was, his store was located at 970, 978 Central Avenue in Cincinnati. Now, Augustus Eitel George was the father of Mrs. Muth, and they ran, uh, she ran, a model Muth Steam Bakery. And you want to learn more about that, you can get that at www.kentoncounty.org, okay? Uh, oral history beekeepers of note. Muths, there's, there was a J.P. Moore in 1890s and the 1900s. Clarence Harden in the 1620s and the 40s was from Pendleton County. And I got that information from Gene Wolf back in 1997. And uh, he raised queens and shipped them all over the world. So you see, Boone County is not separate from Pendleton and Kenton and Campbell. We're all in Northern Kentucky. So forgive me for not saying that we're uh, not ref confining my talk to just uh, Boone County. But there was an Edward Damon and his wife, Nellie Damon. They lived in Atwood in Kenton County in the late 1800s and 1900s. He kept bees there. And um, back in 99, I believe it was, he gave Brad Spencer, his widow gave Brad Spencer a wealth of books on bees. And per my suggestion, Bread is protecting those with controlling humidity and keeping them away from people like me who have a habit of dropping them. 
So he has a very valuable collection. And some of those are dating back to early 1800s. Now, so we're rich in history here. There was Honey Bee Martin. He died at the age of 93, back just a few uh, uh, years ago. He was the beekeeper. Now, in 1982, I remember reading that Honey Bee found 12 queens in one hive. Well, I have found 11 in one half since then. But thanks to Honeybee, I was looking for 12 queens. Now, those, those came about because we, we removed the queen from a choice hive. And the hive was very strong, and they developed more queen cells than what they need. You know, I noticed that there's a few sitting over here and a few back here and a few over here. Honeybees are that way, they're clickish. <laughs> and when I take the queen out, now these bees here came from Campton, Kentucky. Because it's been relatively mild down there. I've kept a tab on the weather. <clears throat> we took those bees out because we wanted the 4-H kids at Breathitt County High School to see those, the animal class. There's a little 17-year-old there that has found bees in a church, a, Method, a Methodist church, and I'm, I'm sorry, Presbyterian church in Elsa, that's near uh, Buckhorn Lake. And we're, I'm taking those out in a few days, arm on arm. We're going to give them to that boy so that he can graduate from high school. I think he needs a successful project. <laughs> okay, but um, there was something else I wanted to add, but anyway. Okay, <clears throat> well, I originated from Appalachia by way of Lexington and UK. 